Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the... Uh, can you hear me? Now you can, yes. Welcome to the um, Multilingual and Intercultural Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, uh, as always, I thank the uh, uh, College of Arts and Sciences for supporting the center of MIC, and also I thank the Provost Office for sponsoring this Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Terence Wiley, who is the President of the Center for Applied Linguistics in Washington Island. And prior to that, Professor Wiley was Executive Dean of the Mary Lou Fulton Institute and Graduate School of Education at Arizona State University, and a Professor of Educational Policy Studies and Applied Linguistics for 10 years. Professor Wiley's publications include the Handbook of Heritage, Community, and Native American Languages, Research Policy and Practice that just came out in 2014, um, Literacy in the Language Diversity in the United States, 205, and Ebonics in the Urban Education Debate, 205. He is a founder and editor of the Journal of Language, Identity, and Education, the International Multilingual Research Journal, the International Journal of the Sociology of Language, and Bilingual Research Journal. He is the recipient of the 2014 American Association for Applied Linguistics Distinguished Scholarship and Service Award. If I were to read his CV, it's going to be very, very long, which I'm not going to do. Uh, I'll just briefly say, I first met Professor Wiley about 15 years ago when I first started looking at heritage languages. And he's one of the pioneers defining and developing uh, the field. His tool one a book chapter titled On Defining Heritage Languages and Their Speakers is a seminal piece that has been cited very, very widely. And Terry and I also share an interest in Chinese language. Uh, you know, uh, when we first met, uh, the, his first question to me was, uh, Agnes, what kind of Chinese do you speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a very unusual question that it tells you the extent to which he's um, sensitive and knowledgeable, too knowledgeable about the diversity of uh, Chinese language. So he is someone who really understands at a personal as well as professional level the value of immigrants and the complexity of immigrant language use. He's also one of the few in the field who can connect policy with practice and scholarship with social responsibility. So I was very honored and uh, gratified when he uh, kindly agreed to come to Stony Brook to speak to us. In fact, he was so supportive that um, he replied, he said, yeah, I, guess I will come and let me know which of the following topics you want me to talk about. And he gave me a list of six or maybe seven, which was the most difficult part of the invitation because I liked all those titles. So in any case, I'm very glad that he's going to speak to us today on a very important topic, and that is um, language immigration and human rights in the US language policy context. So please give a big hand to Professor Terry Thank you. Uh, thank you, Agnes. Uh, uh, Dr. Hu has been uh, a very important figure in uh, some of the areas that uh, uh, we were talking about there in terms of heritage language in particular. And uh, I was uh, very flattered and pleased when I got the invitation uh, to be on the advisory board for the important center that uh, she has uh, recently been involved in founding here. Uh, this is my first uh, trip to Stony Brook. It's a very nice campus and uh, familiar territory. I've spent most of my academic career working at public universities, so this feels very much at home. Um, as Agnes uh, said, I, I gave uh, a list of uh, a number of topics that I might be able to talk about. The one she selected on language rights uh, is one that I have uh, 
uh, worked on again and off again for a period of years uh, in terms of the United States context. It's a story that uh, continues and has new developments uh, uh, as uh, we move along through time. And I would have to say that it's not always a happy story. Um, that, uh, in fact, uh, we, we might be in a, a period of decline from happier days in the past when there was a little more substance uh, in terms of language rights. So uh, today I'm going to cover a lot of ground, and I'm going to probably brush over some things where it would be helpful to have more time. Uh, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'll try to just focus on some highlights. Um, that uh, one of the things that we just uh, had happen uh, a few days ago was uh, International Mother Language Day, which is uh, officially on uh, February uh, 21st. And uh, in Washington, D.C., we collaborated with several other organizations to host an event which focused on the issue of uh, using linguistics for the promotion of peace. And we had a talk by uh, Professor Joe Lobianco on that topic. Um, Today, what I'd like to do is uh, make reference later in the presentation to the U.S. context, but I'll focus primarily on, from a historical framing perspective on the issue of language rights in the United States, and um, also uh, to consider some of the challenges uh, that are emerging in recent years where uh, support for the notion of language rights is, is not even being supported within the field of applied linguistics, where we may find some surprises that we don't have some of the advocacy in the field where we might uh, expect to find it. And then uh, I'll try to end with some examples of uh, positive scholarship from uh, some of the doctoral students and colleagues that I've worked with who I believe are really advancing our understanding uh, of these agendas. So when we talk about uh, language rights, it's important uh, within the context particularly of education to focus on uh, two dimensions. One is the right of access to education, and it's hard to access education if you don't understand the languages that are uh, being used. So that implies some degree of accommodation. Others have also uh, supported the right to an education mediated in one's mother tongue. And uh, this, in many parts of the world and in the United States, has been a harder uh, issue uh, to see supported. It was addressed to some degree uh, when there was federal support for bilingual education. But today, we tend to see it supported more within the context of charter schools and private education rather than being a priority uh, in the national policy. And uh, one of the points that I will uh, make is, uh, it's not a new point, uh, but basically that when we study uh, language policies or language policies in education, it's important to consider what else is happening in society for the groups that may be affected. And uh, I, I don't think we, we get very far from our televisions or our handheld devices to realize that uh, this week uh, Congress is stuck on a, a very important issue that it's been stuck on for a long time, and that's the issue of immigration. So in the background to discussing language diversity in the United States, one of the important things to remember is that there's a wider debate about immigration and about the uh, potential uh, social integration of millions of people in the United States, and that since that is not as re resolved, that it's not unusual then to find in education that issues are also not resolved. So this was actually a point that um, a lawyer from Washington, D.C. made a number of years ago. Back in 1974, he gave a seminal paper in Toronto on language as an instrument of social control. And in that, he basically noted that if we want to understand uh, the motivations behind policy, we need to look at the, con the context uh, beyond education and look at societal uh, 
uh, things that are happening, look at the extent to which people are integrated politically, and look at the extent to which uh, they're, they're part of the economy, or are they encountering various types of discrimination in those cases as well. So even though the focus of this talk is on language rights, the undercurrent uh, of, of what's affecting language rights is really the phenomenon of discrimination. And I think this is a point that we tend to be forgetting recently in the field of applied linguistics. I'll talk about that a little bit later, where we become very interested in analyzing discourse, but we forget that the discourse itself is linked to what's happening to people in the real world in real time. Um, if we think about uh, different orientations to policy, uh, we could come up with more categories than are here. But uh, we basically have uh, probably five or six major orientations to policy. If the, a country like the United States picks a language of instruction, and in the United States, even though we do not have an official language, English tends to be the language of instruction. So that's an example of a promotion-oriented policy. We sometimes have what are called expediency-oriented pol policies. Uh, if you can't read your ballot and you're, you uh, need to be able to read who you're voting for and we create a bilingual ballot, that's an example of expediency. Now, some people uh, don't like that. They say, well, if you're going to participate in this country, you should be able to speak the dominant language. But there are other cases where expediency works in favor of both populations. If you have a communicable disease and you need to get treated, that being able to communicate with your doctor and get treatment also saves the rest of us from getting an infection. So uh, expediency can work in both directions. Uh, if we need to collect taxes and people don't speak English and we can make the tax information accessible in other languages, that helps the government correct, collect revenue. So expediency is really a uh, two-way street. And then we have what's uh, been called uh, tolerance-oriented policies. And this is basically that the government will, will be neutral to whatever people are doing. So we have a number of, uh, say, Saturday schools or weekend schools where languages other than English are taught. They're taught by members of the community. Uh, maybe the language is Chinese. Maybe it's uh, Arabic. Maybe it's Hindi. Uh, these activities are going on. The government doesn't interfere with that, and so that's an example of tolerance. But the agency for that doesn't come from the government, it comes from the communities themselves. And then we have uh, some other types of policies. We have restriction-oriented policies, or occasionally even they're called suppression-oriented policies, where there's actually a legal prohibition on speaking a language. Uh, in the United States, uh, historically, this uh, has occurred uh, during times of war. It's also occurred with specific populations, and we'll be going into that a little bit further. And then I think there's something that, a uh, category uh, which I created that I call no policy, and that's the significant absence of policy where it's needed. And uh, uh, right now, I think we have lots of different children in US schools that are all grouped together under some euphemistic category called English learner, but those are very different types of students. And the failure to differentiate among them means that we have a one-size-fits-all policy. So um, this is a kind of uh, a general framework uh, that uh, has been uh, useful to try to, to try to categorize the types of policies. One of the uh, current things that we hear talked about is that uh, there are high levels of diversity in the United States which are unprecedented and that these are more problematic in the past. Th these kind of arguments are also made in Europe where they've created a new category called super diversity. And uh, so one of the things I think we want to think about is, is the phenomenon of language diversity in the United States or what became the United States really a new phenomenon or is it a continuing phenomenon. And if we go back far enough, prior to European encroachment in the United States uh, on Native American peoples, we could draw a linguistic map of major linguistic families that looks something like this. 
So in the origin of the country, uh, English was not, it did not come down from the mountaintop and golden tablets, but in fact it was something that was brought to the, the continent. And we need to remember that there were many indigenous languages that were here before any European languages, including English. So um, we have, uh, in addition to Native American languages, many speakers of languages other than English uh, that were not necessarily immigrant languages at the time that they were incorporated in the, to the United States. What am I talking about there? I'll show you some maps in a few minutes and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, Spanish and French, for example, were widely used in areas that were not part of the United States but later became part of the United States. And this was largely through the result of war, conquest, and annexation. Among immigrants, um, many Midwestern communities were, were uh, high immigrant areas and German was uh, spoken well into the 20th century as the number two language in the United States before it was surpassed by Spanish sometime after 1970. So uh, German has been around and important for a long time. So we need to consider, uh, apart from just issues of immigration, we need to consider conquest and annexation in the uh, linguistic history of the United States. So in the pre-colonial period, um, the country was, uh, what became the country was linguistically diverse with in indigenous language. English was originally a colonial language. English's dominance was achieved not through the result of official mandate, but through what Shirley Bryce Heath once called status achievement. And uh, missionaries were early promoters of English, but they also used indigenous languages to try to spread their uh, teachings and their methods, and uh, well into the 20th or the 19th century, there were a number of Indian tribes that, in fact, were functioning bilingually and had even developed some of their own scripts. If we look at the so called original 13 colonies here, we see there's a line here that was based on a treaty of the French and Indian War, which was uh, called the Seven Years' War in Europe. It was fought internationally. It was actually the First World War. It was fought in Africa, India, uh, even the Philippines, and in the United States and Europe as a major war. But there was a line that was established here, and this line was to have this area beyond it called Indian Reserve. Now that was set by the British before the American Revolution and one of the things that the revolutionaries wanted to do was to expand the territory of the colonies into that area. Uh, but based on the treaty that the British had signed, that was not possible. So one of the causes of the American Revolution wasn't only about taxation, but it was about land expansion. And as a result of the impetus for land expansion, uh, the, many of the colonists were upset that they, were, they had this treaty line. So as time goes on, we're going to see a contestation for areas that are supposedly reserved for Indians and the uh, colonists and new immigrants coming in who want to go into those lands. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail here. I have written about this uh, in several uh, fairly lengthy discussions. I have a, a chapter from 2013 on a brief history of language rights in the United States. If any of you would like that, I would be happy to send you a PDF of the longer article. But the whole point is that uh, even prior to the establishment of the United States, that there were various policies that had uh, important impacts on different populations. And the very first language policy in the United States of what became the United States during colonial period were uh, what were called compulsory ignorance laws, which did not allow African slaves to become literate in English or to allow them to use their native languages. Were they actually called compulsory ignorance laws? Uh, this is a term that Meyer Weinberg has used, and uh, they, you know, it, he's essentially labeling what the law was doing. And uh, they were part of slave codes. It was illegal uh, to teach a slave uh, to become literate. And 
a so-called free person doing that could be fined or punished uh, for the act of teaching. So that was actually the first language policy and code that we can find in the United States. So as the United States begins to expand, particularly uh, from the early 19th century on, we can see that this Indian reserve is no longer there. And in fact, later uh, Indians are forcibly removed uh, and put in Oklahoma uh, through the, the period called the Trail of Tears. Now we see this large area, which was a pretty good land deal uh, for about $7 million. Louisiana was uh, sold by Napoleon, who was having trouble financing his wars. And the United States acquired this land. The United States acquired this land after uh, General Jackson, who became President Jackson, crossed the border illegally and seized the area. And then we offered to buy it from Spain. So Texas, of course, uh, had undocumented Anglos coming into the state, and they wanted to rebel against Mexico. And uh, ultimately, this they declared independence from Mexico. And then Mexico, or the, this former part of Mexico, was annexed into the United States. We then fought a border war with uh, the country of Mexico. And through military conquest and a treaty thereafter, uh, acquired this area, this last little piece was purchased in 1853. So you get a picture here, right? Uh, there's a famous f phrase from out west, uh, I'm originally from the southwest, uh, that uh, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And I think you can see that the, through the territorial expansion of the United States, there was a lot of uh, the border crossing various peoples that was going on. Now, uh, Thinking about that then, uh, we have these territorial acquisitions and we have various treaties with Native American peoples. We have big uh, immigration occurring after the uh, American uh, Civil War at the same time that legalized segregation is going on in the United States. And as we come forward uh, further, in addition to German migration at the end of the 19th century, we now have uh, massive immigration from uh, Eastern and Southern uh, Europe. And uh, in the aftermath of World War I, we begin to see important cases regarding the status of foreign languages in the United States. And I'll go into a little more detail on that in a minute, so uh, we'll move ahead. The final uh, expansion territorially of the United States has not concluded until the end of World War II. And now you can see that the United States has gone well into the Pacific. Hawaiian Islands were uh, annexed in 1895. Uh, we have US Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico here. And we have all of these uh, trust territories uh, going all the way down to near Indonesia and even near China. Guam and so forth. So the, again, there were people speaking other languages there. Uh, they became incorporated into the United States. Uh, they were not immigrants. So how important is immigration then in explaining language diversity in the United States? And uh, historically, it's been a major factor. Uh, but uh, sometimes when you listen to people talk about the importance of English, you would think it was an indigenous language. Well, no, it was just like the other languages that came from Europe, it was a colonial uh, language. So um, English was also, though, an important language of immigration. And we sometimes forget that, that uh, we didn't only home grow English, we imported it from the uh, UK and from other places in the world. Um, until fairly recently, Canada was one of the largest sources of immigration to the United States. And that was largely an English migration with some migration of French speakers also. And uh, let's see, here we go. OK. So um, we also tended to select people who could come into the country uh, through a quota system uh, in which uh, immigrants from northern and southern Europe, or uh, uh, northern and western Europe, were favored over immigrants from everywhere else around the globe until 1965. 
So there was a certain selectivity in immigration that influenced the linguistic composition of the United States. Uh, the, you know, some of the uh, major Asian immigration that started fairly early in the United States uh, was uh, legally stopped in the 1880s, starting with uh, discrimination against Chinese immigrants, so followed by discrimination against Japanese immigrants in 1906. And so we have to think in terms of how immigration policy has affected language policy in many, many respects. So immigration is important, but other factors are important. And just in terms of raw numbers, we see that at various points in our history, as percentage of population, that there have been past periods of immigration that rival the present. Most importantly, the period after the Civil War up until about 1920. So one of the things that uh, we hear sometimes is that past immigrants were more willing to s assimilate than more recent immigrants. My grandmother, somebody will say, uh, willingly gave up Italian so she could become an English speaker. <coughs> but the more we delve into those histories, we find out that, well, that wasn't exactly true. A lot of those people didn't acquire English so easily. It was their children who did. And um, if, we, if we look at actual patterns of immigration, uh, there's a historian by the name of Wyman that during this period of 1908 to 1923 tried to do actual counts of how many immigrants came and stayed. So w all the ones in red basically indicate a return rate of greater than 30%. So you can see that the least successful immigrants were from southern Italy, and 60% of them actually returned. OK, so uh, are today's immigrants different than that? Some immigrants come for a while. They go back. Uh, some immigrants send money out of country. Immigrants in those days did too. So I think some of the patterns that we see today are uh, somewhat similar to things that we've seen in the past. So what kind of uh, things explain uh, from those policy types how English became dom dominant? Well, there was tolerance toward most European languages, at least up until the late 1880s. And um, there was coercive assimilation, forced assimilation from the very beginning for people from Africa who didn't even try to immigrate here, but were forcibly brought here. Um, there was voluntary assimilation that was encouraged for Native Americans. And over the first 300 years of contact between Americans uh, and colonists and other immigrants, uh, there was a, a fairly high deg degree of biculturalism uh, in, among the, the, the contact there. Uh, but then there was coercive assimilation, which began in the 1880s. And uh, this was where boarding schools were utilized. And, uh, Native American children were put on trains, taken across the country, away from their families, and then uh, were prohibited from using their languages and had forced education in English. So we can see that there's a range of policies here, but they play out differently for different people. And again, if we think about that the whole issue of language rights as a discussion really emerges, as an issue not of entitlement, but of freedom from discrimination first, then how people are treated or how they're incorporated uh, becomes uh, an important uh, issue. Uh, this is a photo taken um, at the uh, Heard Museum in Phoenix, uh, where they have an interesting exhibit on the boarding school period. And this is a famous uh, statement from uh, Captain Richard Pratt in uh, 1879 when they were starting the boarding move, uh, movement period. And you can see that the purpose of coercive assimilation was the idea that you would forcibly, in the terms of the day, civilize uh, the people uh, who were being brought in. Uh, Meyer Weinberg, uh, who is a historian who died a few years ago, uh, did a, a systematic analysis of different ethnic groups in the United States, and he wanted to know how, wh how were they initially brought into the country. 
Uh, some of them came in voluntarily as immigrants. Others were conquered. Uh, African Americans were enslaved, and more recently, some have come in as uh, refugees. Uh, was English compelled? Straight across the board, yes. Were compulsory ignorance laws enforced only for African Americans? Were people legally segregated? That depends on the group and at the time period. So some groups were segregated. There have been major uh, court cases in San Francisco and other parts of the country uh, where uh, Asian populations were uh, the subject of uh, discrimination from the school board and so forth. And then uh, excluded from schools. And here the, the, uh, the, the issue is mixed. We had overt segregation in the South. In the North, we had quotas. So in the North, they didn't say, we will, will not allow you to go to the university if you were Jewish. However, they did have quotas for people who were Jews, for example. And uh, they also had little tricky laws that said, if you were born in a state where you're not allowed to attend a public university, you can't be admitted to the University of Chicago. <laughs> what did that mean? Well, if you were from Alabama and Mississippi and you were black, and you were not eligible to go to school, then that was the same way of dealing with this issue, only a little more creatively uh, in the North. And some of those policies persisted all the way up to the 1950s. Okay, so, um, so anyway, if we try to summarize uh, some of the treatment of populations, we had extensive bilingual education in German under a policy of tolerance. We had racially based exclusion uh, starting after the 1880s and coming to a head during World War I. We had literacy tests uh, which were used after the Civil War as a way of restricting African Americans for voting. Uh, and we also restricted uh, uh, unwanted groups from Europe and other places based on literacy tests that were used for the purposes of immigration. And those practices uh, generally started in uh, around the, the late 19th century and then were refined a little bit in the early 20th century. Uh, during the Americanization movement that began in World War I, uh, we had uh, an increasingly restrictive policy against the instruction in German and other uh, languages. Uh, the U.S. involvement in World War I was in 1917 to 1918, and by 1919, 34 states had passed laws against the teaching of German, particularly to young children. Uh, most states had laws that said you couldn't teach German or foreign languages to any child until they were at least in grade six or grade eight. So these were the predecessors of some of the first English-only laws. And uh, this, uh, of course, began to lead to a rapid decline in uh, schools using German in the United States. During World War I, 25% of all the high school students in the United States were studying German. Mexican in, uh, immigration starts to increase at this time, partly because immigration against Southern and Eastern Europeans is being in increasing during the period of the uh, 1920s. And uh, as a result, uh, there's a kind of uh, understanding that, there, that immigrants coming across to take agricultural jobs are not going to be turned back. But they were ultimately during the Great Depression. Um, there were a couple of really significant cases that occurred right after World War I. The first one was Meyer versus Nebraska, which is really the most important case which gives uh, heritage language schools today the right to exist. And uh, there was a law passed in Nebraska as well as other states that basically said that uh, you cannot teach a uh, foreign language uh, to children in, in that state. And uh, somebody who did it during his lunch hour was this fellow named Meyer, uh, who had students reading the Bible in German during lunch hour, and he was fined. And he fought the case all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, it started in 1919. It got there by 1923. And by a 7 to 2 vote, the Supreme Court ruled that during peacetime, this is an important qualification, 
uh, that uh, it was going too far uh, in terms of due process and taking away rights of parents to decide what their children could learn. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes actually dissented in this, and he felt that this was okay to restrict languages uh, in, in uh, other cases. But uh, I would say of all of the major language rights cases in the United States, this is the most significant one. But it does two things. It says during times of peace, the federal government can't, can't discriminate against people or restrict them from learning languages. However, it also affirmed the rights of states to use English as the medium of instruction. So it really is a kind of double-edged uh, case in, in many respects. So uh, not too long after that, in the territory of Hawaii, uh, Hawaii becomes a state in 1960. Uh, at this time, it was only a territory. There was an attempt to restrict the heritage schools that were teaching Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And uh, the territorial governor was leading the charge against those groups. And uh, based on the Meyer decision in this important case, uh, Farrington, the governor, versus Tokushige, a parent, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that, based on Meyer, that this was not, uh, uh, this was going too far. And there was also an important case in the Philippines, which was then a, a United States territory. Uh, that also affirmed this. Um, but because of the peacetime restriction, uh, when Japanese were put in internment camps during World War II, they weren't allowed to use Japanese. So this peacetime restriction does have some significance. So as we, uh, we move forward, um, there, the next real major shift starts to occur in the civil rights period. Uh, where we've changed the immigration laws. We're now uh, no longer having apartheid-like restrictions on immigration into the United States. Uh, the United States, England, other countries are debating this. Australia, they had all had racially restrictive policies. So the United States wasn't unique in this. But uh, in the aftermath of uh, World War II and in the expansion of rights for people, uh, this is the period that the Federal Bilingual Education Act is passed. And then we had uh, an expediency-related law, which was passed in 1974, Lau versus Nichols, which uh, basically said, if children don't understand the language of instruction, the school is obligated to help them understand English. The San Francisco School District had actually taken the position that their job was to teach children in English. It wasn't their job to help them learn English. If you can imagine that. It was the same position in 1974 that they had taken in 1906. And uh, now, so now, based on Meyer, or based on uh, Lao, uh, school districts have to help children learn the language of instruction. So a giant step forward. OK. Um, so but as we move through the 80s, 90s, uh, we find that increasingly there are attempts to restrict the use of bilingual education. Uh, the, the federal office uh, that uh, supported these efforts uh, increasingly came after attack. And then uh, a fellow by the name of Ron Unz, who was a, a, a computer uh, investor in California started trying to make himself famous by uh, trying to get states to pass laws restricting uh, the, the use of other languages and instruction. And he finally succeeded in 1998 in California, and then in 2000 in Arizona, and then ultimately in Massachusetts a couple of years later. But then after that, it kind of, the movement kind of ran out of gas. So. Um, so in terms of a legacy, uh, there are these important cases that uh, did allow for the right to teach languages. However, states tended to be able to restrict them. And um, in my own analysis of US history, I think the World War I period was really the critical period. Uh, that's when the defining elements of being American also became based on language. And so if you were not an English speaker, you were not seen as being a real American. And uh, some years later, uh, 
Uh, former Senator Paul Simon, basically, who was an advocate of foreign language instruction, he, said, he concluded that there is uh, more than one reason for the lack of emphasis on foreign languages, but one word, Americanization, explains a major part of it. So the idea that Americanization means English, it doesn't mean English plus, you know. So there's nothing wrong with the promotion of English in this country. We certainly absolutely have to do that. Uh, and that's been a major focus of the work of our center, but the restriction side or the discriminatory side is the, the thing that I think we really need to worry about a little bit. So um, what we've seen recently is a manipulation of discourse in terms of policy. So in federal policy, for example, the word bilingual disappears. And uh, uh, Garcia, Ophelia Garcia has noted uh, that uh, we now have to use euphemisms like heritage language because we can't say bilingual even if that's what we're talking about. So um, uh, this strategic lift in, uh, shift in uh, labeling also extends to the, the names of federal offices. The former office of English language, uh, or the new uh, office is English language acquisition uh, language Enhancement and Academic Achievement. This is the former uh, name of the office. So uh, again, the word bilingual now tends to be stigmatized. So uh, what do we conclude then about the salience of language rights in the United States? Uh, frankly, uh, there's a weak legal basis. Uh, we're currently seeing a shift, which is even going in the other direction. Where we do see points of light, if you like to see languages taught, other, you know, in addition to English, not other than English, but in addition to English, uh, it tends to be coming from community efforts uh, more than in other places. And um, so, one of the trends that's been happening within the field, uh, which I think is worth reflecting on, is that in recent years that there has been a kind of an attack on discourse and there's an attack on the construct of human rights uh, as, as being a manifestation of the modernist legacy of Eurocentric so chauvinism. I'm not making this up. Uh, the idea that we're essentializing languages and if we talk about rights that then we're essentializing languages within that uh, uh, construct. And there's also a sense that, well, in globalization, nation states aren't that really important anymore because the forces of, uh, of neoliberalism and the forces of economic integration and globalization are more important. So therefore, why are we spending all this time worrying about rights? And why are we worrying about uh, other kinds of things? And uh, so uh, what, what we tend to see is a focus on some of these things. I don't see any problem with studying bottom-up agency. I think that's great. What are people doing on their own and so forth? But there tends to be a devaluation of long-standing core constructs, including language itself, a lack of interest in language demography by many scholars, and a lack of focus on instances of language discrimination. If you're not concerned with rights, if you're also not concerned with discrimination, I'm wondering what's going on, okay? That just, uh, the, maybe the former, but you're not concerned about the latter? What's happening here? Okay, so um, here's an example from, uh, from uh, Alistair Pennycook about the postmodern shift, for example, and uh, it suggests we are missing the point if we limit our discussions of language policy to the use of certain codes called languages so we don't need, if there's no language, we don't have to talk about language rights. Well, I guess that would follow if there's no language. Okay. And, uh, but then if people aren't allowed to use whatever that thing is, what do we call that? Okay. Um, so uh, you can see that there's a, an attempt to link uh, li language rights and linguistic imperialism to the same uh, construct, and this is uh, just a result of... Uh, uh, discourses that uh, constructed as a neoliberal structure and so forth. Though so language rights then is a discourse uh, panacea for maintaining language diversity. Well, if we think about the power of critique, 
and what we see happening uh, around the world, uh, there's uh, a psychologist by the name of Gergen who uh, some years back with the rise of postmodernist studies, which he was part of, uh, he started taking a kind of uh, reflective look. And there are a lot of post, uh, positive things from a postmodernist perspective uh, that uh, really sharpens our critical lenses and keeps us from essentializing different constructs and so forth. So uh, he's, he's acknowledging that uh, uh, postmodernist critiques basically give us this uh, great critical uh, arsenal at our disposal and that there's virtually nothing that we can't basically uh, put under the microscope of scrutiny and analyze uh, to a point where, where we find something wrong with the construct and so forth. But uh, then he goes on and he's one of the people who he sees being involved in this movement. So he's reflecting on himself as a postmodern scholar and then he goes along and he basically asks, he says, He's concerned about this kind of unbridled pure critique because ultimately it's dismantling almost everything. And uh, he goes on then to, to basically note that uh, if we reflect on processes, what, we wish to, what do we wish to achieve in a world of critical deliberation uh, and, it, you know, is, is this a better alternative? And ultimately, what are the implications of pure critique when we're dealing with human rights? Okay, and within that context, uh, a number of scholars have been noting that the construct of human rights itself is widely under attack, largely as being seen as uh, a product of Eurocentric thinking, and that this 150-year experiment in trying to defend the individual uh, it seems to be coming to an end. Uh, I would recommend this book. It's an interesting intellectual history of the, the whole rise of, of the uh, human rights movement and some of the current attacks on it. But thinking about Mother Language Day, which was uh, just a few days ago, uh, these, the, the, the point that I would like to underscore is that the whole discussion of language rights is not something occurring only as a function of discourse. It's, it's functioning as the way people are treated and the way that they are controlled and restrictions that are put upon them. And probably, uh, you know, this, uh, this day that the United Nations has come to recognize, which was grounded in a historical event uh, in which uh, students who wanted to speak uh, uh, Bangala uh, uh, protested uh, against those who wanted to impose Urdu on them in a place called East Pakistan, and they were shot down. They were massacred, and this is uh, actually a, a, a monument to, to what uh, happened. And some years later, uh, UNESCO decided to make this a day of commemoration for the importance of languages uh, to be seen not as objects of discrimination. Uh, there was a major incident in South Africa of a similar type. There have been many other incidents in other places, uh, but it was probably the, the main trigger for the end of apartheid in South Africa was uh, when uh, students were shot down because they had Afrikaans imposed on them and they weren't allowed to speak their native languages. So my point is that, it, that sometimes we get carried away with the analysis of the discourse about X. In this case, we have the reality of action that has occurred in social space and political space, and that that is really, I think, the more fundamental ground for the discussion about language rights or human rights. They are grounded in acts of discrimination and acts of violence. They are not just factors of discourse. And, uh, you know, if we look at the United Nations has recognized uh, these things in, in uh, various important documents and resolutions and basically says that states should take uh, important measures so that person belonging to these groups would have adequate opportunities to learn their mother tongues or instruction in their mother tongue. But 
The reality is that member states, including the United States, uh, do not always take the, the, their endorsement of these revolutions as binding. And so even in the United States, uh, as well as other countries, uh, uh, major countries, uh, these, these things are, are sometimes, even though they're endorsed in the United Nations, they are not acted upon and they're ignored within the practices of the countries themselves. So this brings us back again to the question, uh, you know, which Hobbesgood raises here, uh, where are we at at the end of this 100-year, 150-year uh, experiment? Uh, just very briefly here in the last couple of minutes, I'd like just to basically acknowledge the fact that within the field of policy analysis, there are other ways to approach the issue of discourse and the issue of policy itself. And uh, one of the more useful points of reference that many of us have found is the work of uh, uh, Yano, who has, she's not really a linguist, but she's, she uh, has created a methodology called interpretive policy analysis. And uh, it basically assumes that scholars themselves are grounded in the times that they live in and are not unaffected by the objects of their study. And uh, so she has written uh, a number of important books uh, illustrating the methodology. And uh, at Arizona State, uh, some years ago, uh, I began uh, referencing this work. And uh, uh, there's an interesting intellectual history of uh, the grounding for interpretive policy analysis. I won't try to go into that right now. But at Arizona State, uh, you know, around 2000, uh, with a number of uh, domestic and international students, we began using this to analyze what was happening, particularly within the context of Arizona's restrictive policies. And uh, we were involved in looking at local agency and community agency. We went, uh, for example, to the Navajo Nation, observed educational practices there. Uh, I worked uh, on the Navajo Education Advisory Committee. And uh, during that period, uh, there was a great increase in the debate, the national debate over human rights. And so I would say, as scholars, we were not unaffected by this. And I think there was a rediscovery of the points, again, that Leibowitz had made earlier, that basically, if we were looking at language restrictions, we wanted to look at a wider field of social problems that were occurring. We're not just talking about whether or not English or Spanish can be used, but we're talking about whether English and Spanish can be used within the context of contestation over immigration. And that context then becomes important. So uh, this, uh, we happen to, a bunch of us happen to be at AERA, uh, the Educational Research Association meeting in San Francisco, and we came out of our presentations and ended up in a march that was going on in San Francisco, and I started photographing the signs that were used and thinking about them, and so here's the claim. Immigrants built this nation. Well, there's the data, so there is some basis to that claim that's being made. And oops, uh, you know, Native American and Mexican land was stolen. Well, we did talk about that, and we did see that. Uh, so there might be some basis to these claims. These are not outrageous claims. They're, in fact, part of the historical understanding of how we got this country. And there were Native American children who on a mass scale were incarcerated and taken from their parents. And most of us would probably not support today a policy in which that were to occur. And, uh, you know, there has been some reflection on this uh, within Native American communities and beyond. We most recently now uh, basically have something that is one of the few promotive uh, policies that has been uh, uh, put forth since 1990. We actually do have a policy now that endorses the promotion of Native American language education. The problem is there's not much money behind it. So, but at least we have an official, uh, an official stance on that. And uh, uh, we have uh, the idea that somehow 
immigrants are illegals. They are not people, they are illegals. And uh, one of the important things that's been brought out uh, by a number of people uh, is that we rarely don't talk about a person as being illegal. We normally talk about behavior as being illegal. The idea that somebody ontologically is illegal is quite a stretch and one that uh, a number of uh, philosophers and others uh, have had some concern about. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go in detail through the rest of this, but uh, I have recently also written an article on the construct of illegal children, uh, which uh, was recently published in uh, Language, Identity, and Education in a volume that Education in a volume that Vai Ramanathan from UC Davis put together. And uh, uh, we, we have a rise in discourse uh, related to the idea that the rights of states should trump the rights of people. And you, in the U.S., uh, there has been, in fact, a Supreme Court uh, decision that basically dealt with the issue of whether children who, by no fault of their own, find themselves living in the United States, whether or not they have a right to an education. And in fact, uh, based on an important decision in 1982, the Supreme Court did say that children, undocumented or not, in the United States have a right to an education. So uh, this is not a small matter because about 7% of all the children right now in the U.S. are undocumented. And in some families, half of the family may be undocumented and half of the family may be documented. So we now are talking about immigration reform within the context of what's going to happen to families as units. So uh, the debate that Congress is stuck on right now, um, and we may not have a department funded in Homeland Security on Monday, uh, is not a small debate, but in fact one where these issues are really coming to fore. So uh, just to point out some work uh, that I think is noteworthy, uh, I mentioned the work of Byron and Othran, uh, who's been working on the construct of this citizenship and how that relates to issues of language and uh, uh, I think the immigration debate is really behind a lot of what we're doing. And uh, most of the folks in this picture here have actually written on these topics. And these are just a few of the books that deal with this issue of language uh, in its relationship to immigration and contestation. Uh, some also being written uh, in, in terms of the focus on Native Americans, indigenous languages, and uh, uh, I'll end with one which I think is particularly noteworthy, uh, the activities of uh, the UCLA Civil Rights Project where a number of scholars got together and analyzed uh, the uh, language uh, practices in Arizona from the standpoint of discrimination and the impact that they were having. And most recently, Sarah Catherine Moore, who collected uh, based upon a series of dissertations done in Arizona and put them into uh, a book which is Language Policy Process and Consequences of the Arizona Case Studies. And one of the people who contributed to that was uh, Tim Hogan, who was the lawyer who fought the case to the Supreme Court. The result of that case in a 5-4 decision a couple of years ago was that uh, states have the right to determine essentially their own effectiveness in providing educational services to children. And uh, a lot of us feel that that case is a major setback uh, for the standpoint of the rights of children and the rights of people to get an adequate education and to have their language needs accommodated. But this, this story goes on. And if the government shuts down part of the agencies on Monday, we'll see the demonstration of the fact that this really is an important debate in the United States right now. Thank you. Yes. 
it's, a, it, it's actually a long uh, saga that starts in 1977 uh, when there came an attack on what was called affirmative ethnicity. Uh, I think one of the discourse strategies that we've seen is to flip terms. Now, we have a term called affirmative action. And this, uh, this argument uh, that was put forward starting uh, by Noel Epson in 1977 in a book he wrote, he attacked it called affirmative ethnicity. The idea was you have to be American first, homogenized. You cannot assert your ethnicity over and above being an American. Well, nobody was particularly doing that anyway, but the allegation was that people were trying to assert a language over and above English. And uh, that argument caught hold. There, there was an attempt uh, several times, starting with S.A.I. Hayakawa in the 1980s, and then ultimately ending with Newt Gingrich on uh, the 104th Congress, uh, which attempted to make English the official language, with not the attempt just to officialize English, but to restrict other languages. And that's the critical part. Uh, the majority of states today have made English their official language. Uh, New Mexico has two official languages, English and Spanish. Hawaii has two official languages, English and Hawaiian. So there's nothing inherent within the officialization of a language that does anything particularly special unless you add restrictions. And that's uh, the, the, the greater concern uh, Arizona in uh, the, uh, I believe the late 80s attempted to make English the official language and restrict other languages to bring more competition down. Uh, but subsequently, not, probably 35 states or so have made English their official language or full official language. Yes? I didn't hear the first part. You were talking about diversity in high school? Yeah. And all the issues going on right now with immigration? How uh -huh. do you think it's affecting diversity in high school, if it is at all? Well, the, the country is actually, in the short term, becoming more uh, diverse. And there, there are uh, a number of statistics that I think are missing. There's, there's probably a, a higher percentage of so-called English learners or kids come from families where other languages are spoken. We have the population identified as dreamers. And those are essentially the kids who <coughs> came here very young and in many cases may have even lost the original language or the family language, but they don't have legal status. So Obama's executive order a couple of years ago was designed to address that population. Uh, and uh, the idea is people are here, they've studied their whole life, uh, you know, we're going to charge them foreign student tuition to go to this university. Uh, and this, this has been debated. Uh, the state of Maryland voted on this recently and said, no, these kids should be allowed to go to the university. So, but that's an area of contestation. Uh, so, uh, the one thing that I think we see, those of us in the field of heritage language education, is that the United States is missing a tremendous resource of, of additional language education by virtue of the fact that we don't build and continue education for languages of the home. And uh, we have millions and millions of children in the United States who live in homes where languages other than English are, not, are, are spoken, but they don't have the opportunity even, those languages aren't offered. So it's not that they're restricted, but they're not offered because no resources. Uh, have been allocated. And uh, so some of those kids, some of you in fact, may, by the time you get here, may have for the first time the opportunity to study your family language at school, you know, as a foreign language. Uh, ironically, uh, on the Navajo Nation, uh, Arizona had passed this restriction against the use of other languages. Uh, but if you could prove you were proficient in English, you'd be allowed to study foreign language. So the Navajo Nation all right, wanted to offer Navajo bilingual education. Uh, but they first had to certify that their children were native speakers of English so they could learn Navajo as a foreign language. Okay, so that's a pretty convoluted language policy. 
Thank you. 
but uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.